Have you ever thought about what goes on in the skies thousands of feet above the ground? There are a lot of mysterious events in aviation history that have left the whole world shocked and scientists confused. Join us as we show you the 10 creepiest events that happened in mid-flight, shaking the world. Number 10. A plane landed 37 years late. Yeah, you heard right. A plane was in transit for a whole 37 years, but the craziest part is no one on the plane knew that they have spent 37 years of their lives on a plane. Crazy! How did that even happen? The plane known as Pan Am Flight 914 was a Douglas DC-4. It was carrying 57 passengers and six crew members on July 2, 1955. The plane took off from a New York City airport headed for Miami, Florida, and normally it should last a couple of hours, but it never arrived in Miami. But shockingly, it showed up, unannounced and invisible to Caracas radar, on March 9, 1985. According to the ground handlers, the passengers looked scared and shocked looking at a whole new world. The pilot, for his part, dropped a small calendar out the window before he made a hasty turn back to the runway where he took off and disappeared as suddenly as he had arrived. And yes, the calendar might have helped to shed light on this mystery, right? But unfortunately, no one has information about the calendar. The governments of both Venezuela and the United States were said to have seized the calendar and the tower tapes and have refused to comment on the incident even once in the intervening decades. But what exactly happened to Flight 914? Since the story has been going around the internet, there's been a lot of theories, and the most popular is that the plane passed through some kind of time portal or wormhole, and instead of landing in Miami in 1955, it appeared on arrival in Venezuela 30 years later. However, another story states that the plane went back through the wormhole after it left Caracas. There is nothing like evidence to say that it happened for real or not. And if we're being honest, this story sounds so much like a movie, but if it happened for real, it sure is too creepy to be experienced. Number 9. A Convertible Plane You must have seen a lot of convertible cars, but planes? I doubt that. Well, this plane known as Flight 243 wasn't made a convertible. One thing led to another. The plane departed from Hilo International Airport on April 28, 1988, with five crew members and 90 passengers on board bound for Honolulu. During the departure inspection, nothing unusual was observed. The plane seemed to be in good condition having completed three round-trip flights from Honolulu to Hilo, Maui, and Kauai earlier that day. After the plane took off, everything was normal until it reached its normal flight altitude of 24,000 feet when a section on the left side of the roof ruptured with a whooshing sound. The captain didn't notice but felt the aircraft roll to the left and right and suddenly, the controls went loose. That was the moment one of the officers noticed debris floating in the cockpit. The officers looked back and saw that the cockpit door had broken away, and they could stare directly into the blue sky. A large section of the roof with a length of about 18 feet had torn off. Immediately, the roof tore open, and a 58-year-old flight attendant named Clarabelle Lansing was swept out of the airplane while standing near the fifth row seats and her body was never found. Even though the passengers had their seatbelts fastened, eight people suffered serious injuries. The pilot flying the plane at the time, Officer Tompkins, could no longer control it. Captain Schornsteimer took over controls and performed an immediate emergency descent. The crew declared an emergency and diverted to Kahului Airport for an emergency landing, but it's not over until it is over. During the approach to the airport, the left engine failed, and the flight crew was unsure if the nose gear was lowered correctly. But fortunately, they were able to land normally, 13 minutes after the incident. Upon landing, the aircraft's emergency evacuation slides were deployed and passengers quickly evacuated from the aircraft. That was absolutely scary. Number 8. The Plane Without a Captain What happens when a captain is not on a ship? Simply say safety is not guaranteed. This is the case of this plane that somehow lost its pilot mid-air. The plane, Helios 522, was scheduled to leave Larnaca and fly to Prague Resign International Airport, with a stop-off at Athens International Airport. When the aircraft arrived at Larnaca from London, the previous flight crew had reported a frozen door seal and abnormal noises coming from the right service door. They requested a full inspection of the door, 
The inspection was done by a ground engineer who set the pressurization system to manual because he didn't want to require the plane's engine. However, when he was done, he failed to reset it back to auto. And even after the aircraft was returned to service, the flight crew did not notice the incorrect setting on the pressurization system even after checking three times. The aircraft took off with the pressurization system still set to manual and the aft outflow valve partially open. As the aircraft climbed, the pressure inside the cabin gradually decreased. As it passed through an altitude of 12,040 feet, the cabin altitude warning horn sounded. The warning was to stop the crew from climbing, but somehow they misidentified it as a takeoff configuration warning, which signals that the aircraft is not ready for takeoff, and that signal can only happen on the ground. However, the alert sound for both warnings is identical. In the next few minutes, several warning lights on the overhead panel in the cockpit illuminated, and at an altitude of 18,000 feet, the oxygen masks in the passenger cabin automatically deployed. Shortly after the cabin altitude warning sounded, the captain radioed the Helios Operations Center and reported that the takeoff configuration warning was on. He then spoke to the ground engineer and repeatedly stated that the cooling ventilation fan lights were off as well. The aircraft continued to climb until it leveled off at FL-340, which is approximately 34,000 feet. Nicosia ATC, responsible for controlling air traffic in that region, repeatedly attempted to contact the aircraft, but without success. At that point, the Greek military decided to intervene, but it is, however, not clear who invited them. The military intercepted the passenger jet and observed that the first officer was slumped motionless at the controls and the captain's seat was empty. A flight attendant, Andreas Prodromu, and his girlfriend who was also a flight attendant entered the cockpit and tried to salvage the situation. Although Prodromu was licensed to fly a plane, he was not licensed to fly the Boeing 737. At the cockpit, he decided to do something to ensure everyone was safe when the left engine flamed out due to fuel exhaustion. The plane left the holding pattern and started to descend. Prodromu succeeded in banking the plane away from Athens and towards a rural area as the engines flamed out. Ten minutes after the loss of power from the left engine, the right engine also flamed out, and soon the aircraft crashed into hills near Grammatico, 40 kilometers from Athens, killing all 121 passengers and crew on board. Number 7. Miraculous Landing Don't get it twisted. This landing is not about an aircraft, just that it was caused by an aircraft. You'll soon find out. This particular aircraft is called JAT Flight 367, flying from Stockholm to Belgrade with stopovers in Copenhagen and Zagreb. It arrived in Denmark on January 25, 1972. The aviation management confused a flight attendant named Vesna Vulovic for another attendant named Vesna and swapped the two into different planes. Vesna Vulovic was, however, on Flight 367. She was excited to be on board because it was her first time going to Denmark. The flight departed from Stockholm Arlanda Airport at 1.30 p.m. on January 26 and landed at Copenhagen Airport at 2.30 p.m. Vesna said she saw an angry man who got off the plane but never boarded it again. At 3.15 p.m., the flight departed from Copenhagen Airport in good condition only for an explosion to tear through the baggage compartment about 45 minutes later. The explosion caused the aircraft to break apart over the Czechoslovak village of Srpska Kamenice. Of the 20 passengers and crew on board, Vesna was the only survivor. Vesna was found by a villager named Bruno Honka, who heard her screaming amid the wreckage. Her turquoise uniform was covered in blood, and her stiletto heels had been torn off by the force of the impact. Honka had been a medic during the Second World War, and was able to keep Vesna alive until rescuers arrived. You must be wondering how Vesna remained alive even after the crash. Well, she had a miraculous landing. Air safety investigators attributed Vesna's survival to her being trapped by a food cart in the plane's fuselage as it broke away from the rest of the aircraft and plummeted toward the ground. When the cabin depressurized, the passengers and other flight crew were blown out of the aircraft and fell to their deaths. Investigators believed that the fuselage, with Vesna pinned inside, landed at an angle in a heavily wooded and snow-covered mountainside, which cushioned the impact. Physicians also said that Vesna's history of low blood pressure caused her to pass out quickly after the cabin depressurized and kept her heart from bursting on impact. 
And if you're wondering how she managed to get a job with her low blood pressure, Vesna drank a good amount of coffee to conceal the fact, and she got accepted. Vesna spent days in a coma having fractured her skull and suffered a cerebral hemorrhage. She also suffered two broken legs and three broken vertebrae, one of which was crushed completely. Her pelvis and several of her ribs were also broken. All of her injuries made her paralyzed, and she also suffered from total amnesia. The landing aside, Vesna was the miracle. Number 6. A pilot in, a pilot out. Pilot Atchison handled a routine takeoff of Flight 5390 and handed control to Pilot Lancaster as the plane continued to climb. Both pilots released their shoulder harnesses, and Lancaster loosened his lap belt. About 30 minutes later, the plane had climbed through about 17,300 feet over Didcot, Oxfordshire, and the cabin crew was preparing for meal service. As flight attendant Nigel Ogden was entering the cockpit, they heard a loud bang, and the cabin was quickly filled with condensation. In a blink of an eye, the left windscreen panel on Lancaster's side of the flight deck had separated from the forward fuselage and immediately, Lancaster was propelled out of his seat by the rushing air from the decompression and forced headfirst out of the flight deck. Fortunately, his knees were caught on the flight controls and his upper torso remained outside the aircraft, exposed to extreme wind and cold. The autopilot had disengaged, causing the plane to descend rapidly. The flight deck door was blown inward onto the control console, blocking the throttle control, which in turn caused the aircraft to gain speed as it descended. Flight attendant Ogden rushed to grab Lancaster's belt, while the other two flight attendants secured loose objects, reassured passengers, and instructed them to adopt brace positions in anticipation of an emergency landing. The plane was not equipped with oxygen for everyone on board, so Atchison began a rapid emergency descent to reach an altitude with sufficient air pressure. He then re-engaged the autopilot and broadcast a distress call, but he was unable to hear the response from air traffic control because of wind noise. This caused a delay in the initiation of emergency procedures. Ogden, still holding on to Lancaster, became exhausted so others took over from him and held on to the captain. At that time, Lancaster had shifted several centimeters farther outside, and his head was repeatedly striking the side of the fuselage. No one thought Lancaster would be alive, but they thought it would be better to have his body at least, and also to avoid his body striking the left wing, engine, or horizontal stabilizer, potentially damaging it. Eventually, Atchison was able to hear the clearance from the air traffic control to make an emergency landing at Southampton Airport. The flight attendants managed to free Lancaster's ankles from the flight controls while still keeping hold of him. Eventually, the aircraft landed at Southampton and the passengers disembarked using boarding steps. It was until then the crew realized that Lancaster had survived with frostbite, bruising, shock and fractures to his right arm, left thumb and right wrist. Ogden also had cuts and bruises to his arm and, of course, suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. Imagine how scared Lancaster and the crew would have been. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. This image is a weird one, and it looks too unreal. It looks like a plane transporting ghosts from the underworld to the Earth. It is creepy and at the same time confusing. And if you're wondering what this is all about, you should stick around as we explain in detail what this image is all about. Have you ever been on a plane and had some strange a mid-air event? If so, please let us know your experience in the comments below. Number 5. The Flight That Vanished Without a Trace On January 30, 1979, the Boeing 707-323C, registered as PPVLU, disappeared en route from Narita International Airport to Los Angeles International Airport. It was supposed to stop at Rio de Janeiro Galeo International Airport, but it never got there. The plane was a cargo aircraft, operated by Varig. After it took off from Narita International Airport at 23 minutes past 8 p.m., the last time anyone heard from it was at 8.45. The flight crew was expected to radio at 9.23, but they did not do so. Radio contact was lost about 200 kilometers from Tokyo, and that was it. The cargo aircraft was carrying 53 paintings by Manabu Mabe, returning from a Tokyo exhibition. The paintings were valued at $1.2 million, but neither the wreck nor the paintings were ever found. This resulted in different theories. 
One says that the six-man flight crew could have made a plan to take the paintings for themselves, and another states that an awful malfunction might have destroyed the whole plane, leaving nothing as evidence. While the second theory seems reasonable, the first one leaves too many questions, one of which is, if the crew took the paintings, they would have sold them somewhere, and that way, they would have been traced. But to this day, no one has heard about the paintings or the crew, which makes this event a scary one. Number 4. Amelia Earhart A creepier case is the case of Amelia Earhart's disappearance. But before we talk about it, let's get familiar with Amelia herself. Amelia Earhart grew up to become a pioneer in aviation history and a champion for women's rights. She was the first woman to cross the Atlantic in an aircraft in 1928, just a year after Charles Lindbergh's history-making solo transatlantic flight. On that flight, Amelia was merely a passenger with no training on an aircraft piloted by Wilmer Stultz. But Amelia wished she could try it alone someday. Her someday came in four years when she became the first woman to make a solo transatlantic flight, a feat for which she was awarded the United States Distinguished Flying Cross. But Amelia was a woman who wouldn't sleep over an achievement. She continued to break records, which includes the completion of the first successful solo flight from Honolulu to Oakland, California. But even with Amelia's success, there was still one flight that she wished to attempt, a circumnavigation of the globe as near its waistline as could be. It is not that flights circling the globe had not been completed before, but Amelia's proposed flight would span an unprecedented 29,000 miles. She intended to fly as nearly as possible around the equator, circumnavigating the globe at its widest point. That's crazy. But no one doubted it, because Amelia was a known goal-getter. Amelia chose Captain Harry Manning as her co-pilot, and he was to act as her navigator on the flight but he was also a skilled pilot in his own right. She also hired a radio operator who knew Morse code, and Fred Noonan, a ship's captain and former navigation trainer for Pan Am, who was familiar with both marine and flight navigation. On May 20, 1937, Amelia and Noonan left Oakland, California in an aircraft that was built to Amelia's taste, a plane she named Flying Laboratory. Three days later, they arrived in Miami, Florida, where they officially announced Amelia's plan for a second attempt to circumnavigate the globe. On June 1, they departed Miami, and the true voyage began. Despite the modifications done to the plane to increase its range, the plane was not capable of crossing the kinds of massive distances planes regularly do today without refueling, so the expedition would require stops in destinations such as Puerto Rico, Suriname, Brazil, Senegal, India, Burma, and more. On June 29th, they touched down in Ley, New Guinea, and prepared to begin the longest leg of their journey, flying from there to Howland Island. On July 2, Amelia and Noonan departed Ley at 10 in the morning. Their proposed route would take them across more than 2,000 miles of open ocean to the small island, and their navigation was intended to be helped by the fact that a ship named USCGC Itasca had been sent there ahead of them. But somewhere and somehow in the course of the 20-hour flight, they disappeared. Their last known position report placed them near the Nukumanu Islands, an atoll of Papua New Guinea, some 800 miles into their flight. The last radio messages received from the flight came early in the morning, with Amelia estimating they were within 200 miles of Howland. Amelia said in her messages that they must be on the ship but could not see it. That was the last time anyone ever heard from Amelia and her crew. Within an hour of her last message, Itasca started the search and soon was joined by another search team by the authorities. But unfortunately, there was no trace of Amelia, Noonan, or their plane. Years after the disappearance, different theories have been put forth about what might have happened, but the most widely accepted was the crash and sink theory. It is believed that the plane must have crashed and sunk into an unknown location. However, years later, a shoe that looks like the one Amelia had worn to board the plane was found on the shore of an island. This made the crash and sink theory widely accepted. Number three, the lost flight that reappeared with skeletons. Now to the story you have been waiting for. Back in 1954, Santiago Airlines Flight 513 took off on September 4, 1955 from Aachen, West Germany, and was scheduled to arrive in Porto Alegre, Brazil, 18 hours later. But somehow, 
the airplane mysteriously disappeared mid-flight over the Atlantic Ocean. Back then, authorities believed that the plane had crashed, and for the years to follow, multiple search parties were formed to look out for the remains of the passengers or the plane, but nothing was found. Two years after the disappearance, Santiago Airlines had already run out of business. Days turned into months, and months into many years, but nothing was heard about the plane. After failing to find even a single trace of evidence of a plane crash, the search was called off. But three and a half decades later, on October 12, 1989, the Porto Alegre Airport in Brazil spotted an unauthorized aircraft circling the airbase. The air traffic controllers tried contacting the pilot, but they got no response. Eventually, the plane came close to the runway and landed perfectly. It looked in a well-maintained shape, and the engines were still up and running even after the plane touched base. No one came out of the plane, and so the airport authorities approached the plane cautiously. As they opened the doors from the outside, what they saw gave them a chill down their spines. They found 92 perfectly preserved skeletons of the people on board, which includes 88 passengers and four crew members. The craziest part is they were all buckled into their seats, and the creepiest part is the plane's pilot, Captain Miguel Victor Curie, also found in a skeletal form, with his hands on the controls. Are you thinking what I am thinking? This story just doesn't add up, and honestly, a lot of people consider it to be false for three reasons. The first reason is that the news about this flight was published by Weekly World News, which was known for publishing fictional stories in their tabloids more often than not. Four years before releasing the story on Flight 513, they had published the story of Pan Am Flight 914, which went missing for 37 years before reappearing and landing unscathed. Another reason is that the mysterious story of Santiago Flight 513 seems too similar to an episode of a 1961 show, The Twilight Zone, titled The Odyssey of Flight 33, in which the aircraft travels back in time to 1939. And lastly, when news from 1954 was traced back, there was nothing about Flight 513 anywhere, so all we are left with is weekly world newspaper to know if the story is true or not. Do you think this story is true? Let's know what you believe in the comment section. Number 2. A plane that lost its engine. The Delta Flight 1425 is a 32-year-old plane traveling from Atlanta to Baltimore. But as the plane was mid-air, there was a loud bang and the whole cabin was filled with smoke. Immediately, the captain announced the plane had lost an engine and preparations were being made for an emergency landing. At that point, everyone on the plane began to fear the worst. Passengers on board began to panic as the plane started slowing down. Most people took out their phones and texted their loved ones for fear that it would be their last. But while everyone was sending messages to their families, one passenger was shooting a video of the whole scene and something scary caught his attention. He saw a metal part moving around inside the engine with an orange glow behind it. It appeared that a nose cone was loose inside one of the engines, therefore, causing the problem. The flight crew from Atlanta to Baltimore chose to divert to Raleigh out of an abundance of caution after receiving an indication of a possible issue with one of the aircraft's engines. The flight attendants told the passengers to brace for the emergency landing and, fortunately, the flight carrying 154 people landed safely in Raleigh, North Carolina. Number 1. Ghosts on a Plane Almost 51 years ago, Eastern Airlines Flight 401 crashed into the Florida Everglades on December 19, 72. The aircraft was a Lockheed L-10-11-1 TriStar, traveling from New York to Miami. According to the Aviation Safety Network, Eastern Airlines had 163 passengers and 13 members of crew on board, totaling 176 occupants altogether. The journey started without a problem, but as they got close to Miami, the flight crew noticed a fault indication in the cockpit. They had not realized that the autopilot was disconnected, which ultimately caused the plane to lose altitude and crash. Although 75 people survived, the accident still resulted in the deaths of 101 occupants, including Captain Robert Loft, popularly known as Bob, and flight engineer Donald Repo, known as Don. It was the first fatal crash involving not only the Lockheed TriStar, but indeed a wide-body aircraft of any kind. 
The tragedy was also the second deadliest plane crash in U.S. history at the time, although today it now ranks in 16th place. Days later, authorities retrieved the wreckage of the aircraft from the swamp, and they were able to salvage some of its parts, and the usable ones were used again on the Eastern Airlines fleet. This became the beginning of serious trouble. On different occasions, people started giving accounts of eerie sightings of Bob and Don in the aisle, cockpit, and galley. For example, the vice president of Eastern Airlines once boarded a flight from New York and chatted with a pilot, who he assumed was in charge of that sector. Later, he claimed the pilot he'd been speaking to was Bob, who had died in the plane crash 50 years ago. We could have agreed that the vice president was hallucinating, but he was not the only one to give such an account. On a different day, a captain was asked to check on a passenger in first class who was in a pilot's uniform. The senior flight attendant said the passenger was dazed and unresponsive when they spoke to him, and as if that was not enough, he was not on the passenger list. The captain recognized the passenger as Bob. Also, Don has been reportedly seen on flights in a mysterious manner as well. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.